All right, what's going on, beautiful people? Uh, today is another Sunday, a beautiful Sunday here in the Philadelphia area. Uh, this is Omawale After Dark. Of course, I am Brother Omawale. I'm the guy here on this particular channel, you know, one channel, four streams of content. Um, if you are here for the first time, please do make sure you hit the like button. Feel free to subscribe. Uh, Y'all share the live. This is going to be a good live. Y'all know how we do it on Sunday night. Sunday is pretty, uh, pretty relaxed. Um, I usually kind of warm y'all up with a little bit of music, but tonight I have a very special guest uh, joining us in conversation tonight. So I don't even want to stall with too much of the music. Um, I just want to let the family come into the room. So if you are here, show some love in the room. You, you know, just hit the like button as soon as you pull up. Say something in the comments. There go my guy, Brooklyn Zone. Brother Bomani, uh, BB Fahudie family, <laughs> what's good? What's good? What's good? What's good? Yeah, we got another. We got we got another one of your one of your Brooklyn fam uh, with us tonight, brother Bomani. So you should you should enjoy the build. Um, tonight's topic: we building on pathways to uh, economic independence for Black men in America. We got upstate New York in the building. Shout out Chris Johnson. What's good with you, fam? Uh, shout out Ladaren Kendricks. First time. Welcome, 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 welcome. Hope you subscribe. Uh, my guy, Slam Bradley, of course. Listen, man, we family over here. Uh, my brother Ladaren, or Ladarian, it looks like. That's how your name is pronounced. Uh, you know, pardon if I'm messing up your name, my brother. Um, but um, yeah, like I said, we won channel four streams of content. So every Monday we have our Manhood Mondays that kick off at 8.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, where we have an episode of the Race, Manhood, and Power that's immediately followed by live office hours with Professor Omawale. Uh, then every Sunday at 8 p.m. we have Omawale After Dark, which you are here for this evening. And of course, we have our going off topic, uh, which is our branded interview panel, game night, all of the above. So. We actually got a pretty dope, um, some dope stuff coming out with, with, with going off topic really soon. Uh, this Friday, we drop in an interview with Dr. Tia Sine Johnson, so you'll definitely want to check that out. Um, and then we have a panel that we are doing um, with the going off topic brand, and the panel is on, um, is twerking an African cultural practice, right? So we put that out there. There was so there were so many uh, uh, polarized viewpoints on this particular topic. So I know that's going to be a great conversation. So let me just say a BB Fahudier to everybody in the chat. Uh, WT Funk is this greetings from Germany. D and Sir, what camera are you using? As you mad clear, and I need to upgrade. Family, listen, 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 listen. I can, you know, I can't promote the cameras over here because they ain't really paying me no sponsorship to promote the camera. But I, I think we got a, let's just say we got a DSLR camera. You know, we got uh, two of those going. You I mean camera A, camera B? But you know, as we grow the channel, we definitely gonna be making the uh, the investments, right, and all of the equipment because you always want to invest in your craft. Um, but I appreciate you shouting out, uh, brother Noble War Prize. I appreciate you being here, and of course, sister Chelsea. I appreciate you being here, family. But listen. I got y'all in the building, and without any further ado, I want to bring my guest to the stage. My guest tonight is Brother Mbwebe Ishenge. So let me bring my brother to the stage. Hold on one second. <laughs> Welcome to the show, my guy, Brother Mbwebe. How are you? Brother Abibi Fahudie. What up? Abibi That's what's up. Sure. That's what's up. All right, listen. Um, I you know we were shopping it up a little bit backstage before before I brought you on, and like I said, uh, the Omawali after dark. This is you mean we we let our hair down, we kick our feet up. It's family over here, so we just gonna vibe like we at the cookout. You know what I'm saying vegan cookout, whatever you want to call it. We gonna vibe. It's a good day in Brooklyn. I mean, I met a good brother. He had something dope on his shirt. We struck up a conversation. So that's that's the energy for tonight. Um, but I just want to first let you go ahead and introduce yourself, uh, you know, to the audience, um, and we'll go for there from there and have a good conversation. All right, man. Um, first of all, give thanks for the opportunity to speak to you know you and your platform and your people, the tribe. I like to call it. Um, mm -hmm. I see from the stuff in the chat that we definitely from the same tribe. I'm seeing the BB for Hodiers. I'm seeing the RBGs everywhere. So we definitely you know of that same bloodline, and I'm just giving thanks to be in this type of circle talking about what we're going to talk about tonight because you know finances is really you know among the things that are seldom talked about in our tribes and i really think that we need to be a point with that but um 
just a little backdrop of myself and Boy Bear Shangi, um, Brooklyn, New York, um, um, lover of history, African history. Um, one of my Jagnas, dear Jagnas, is Anthony Browder. Um, studied all of the scholars, uh, you know, your Francis Cresswell sings, your, you know, uh, um, Chancellor Williams, uh, Amos Wilson, et cetera. Um, and just really trying to manifest that, uh, that, that history, that glorious history we have to bring it into today's world and not just talk about the histories of what we did in the past, but what can we do today? You know what I'm okay. saying? Like, what is the manifestation plan today? Tangible manifestation. And it involves building wealth to be able to do that because ain't nobody going to give us a handout to free ourselves. We should, we should know that by now. No doubt. No doubt. Yeah. Um, and, and Boy Bay, uh, what does that mean? I'm only asking because um, the organization that I work with, Afrocentricity International, we have something called the Dina Ceremony, which um, the word, the term Dina means uh, naming. And the uh, Shongo language, I think that's the language spoken by the people of the Congo. So we have the ceremony annually where people uh, rid themselves of their slave names and take on African names. And as you as you know, African names tell a story. Mm -hmm. So the name Mbwebe and Ishenge, and hopefully I don't, if I'm messing a name up, please correct me. But just, you know, give us the story behind that. What does that name mean? Brother? Absolutely. So, so if, if um, interesting thing about, <clears throat> as you mentioned, with names like things happen in divine time. And, you know, I wasn't looking for a new name at all. Um, it's just one day I woke up from a sleep with Mbwebe being echoed in my mind. And it was I was told to not forget the word. And I was like, OK, you know, fine. And then three years later, um, I'm in <clears throat> Harborview, Jamaica, um, hanging out with some of my brethren. And um, I'm, I'm reading KRS-One's book, Ruminations. And we know that KRS-One, his name is an acronym. It means knowledge ain't supreme over nearly everyone. Mm -hmm. I've always known that, but in the book he actually wrote it out. And when I read it, as he writ had as he had written it, my name came to me, and it said, "Embuebe, mind and body working equally exudes blessings eternal." So translation is, if I keep my mind and my body working equally, along with my spirit, the blessings will continue to come. So it's a daily affirmation, and it was simply like that. It wasn't planned. It was more divine, ancestral tap like here this is what it is and, and this is what you're going to define yourself as and then uh so Mbwebe became my name and then Ishangi is just to pay homage uh to one of the most uh you know I would say the most elegant and you know from the Ashangi family Baba Ashangi was a dance African dancer and uh not that I'm a dancer or whatnot but you know I grew really uh, really fond of family and what his his contributions were to the craft of self-expression in the arts of dance. So I took on that name as well as the Shangi just to, again, you know, uphold the tenets of reclaiming ourselves in a an elite light to, uh, you know, push the narrative and understand that we can be greater than what we think we are. Super dope, man. I mean, I like, I, I, I really, I really like the story behind that. And I see on, on your shirt here, it says yeah. uh, crypto woke financial uh, sustainability movement. Yeah, tell, sure. tell, tell us a little bit about that. And when you're having that discussion in terms of what this movement is that you are the founder of, I would also be interested in hearing how those elders, those Jegnas, you know, such as, you know, the Browders, the, you know, the Clarks, the Amos Wilsons, how they inform your, your work that you are doing to uh, educate our people about wealth. Yeah. Um, well, for, first of all, just to go back, um, I've been in this space um, for a good 30 years. Um, I've been a writer. I started a magazine in 1993 called The Ghetto Times Magazine, uh, which is an African-centered publication used to debunk the chauffeur myths of, you know, white dependency. And uh, so I've been, you know, again, I, I traveled the, the lecture circuit, the Ivan Van Sertimas, the Dr. Ben, the Dr. Clarks, the Tony Browders, et cetera, um, sitting at the forefront of their feet, learning whatever I could to reclaim myself, remember, as Tony Browder would say, re or put back together that story that was taken from us. Um, and then <clears throat> the one thing I did see, not to but they put so much time into their craft of reclaiming our history that they weren't separated while they were alive. <clears throat> there isn't a pension plan for these elders. So, you know, they weren't getting steady paychecks. They were on the road doing their speaking lectures and selling books and whatnot to earn a living. And I noticed early on in my life that I said I didn't want to have to struggle 
to get the message out to our people. Mm -hmm. um, so that's where finance really became a part of my life, but it didn't hit reality until uh, March 13, 2017. After working for the National Basketball Association for 12 years, um, I was fired from my job because of my social media presence. And all I was putting out was information about you know, African history and, and reclaiming our histories. It had nothing to do against the NBA. I was on my own time doing it, but they saw me as a threat, obviously, because 80% of the basketball players are black, so they don't want me to reach to them, even though mm. I've been there for 12 years. But uh, nevertheless, that is when I was faced with the reality of what do you do when you lose your main source of income? How do you take care of yourself every 30 days? And instead of me trying to find another corporate plantation to get on after I was kicked off of this one, I understood that I needed to really understand what this is all about. Everything we do every day is about money. And unfortunately, we live in a capitalistic world and that's what governs everything. As, as Wu-Tang would say, cash was everything around me. You know, now it's really currency. It doesn't just, it's just cash, it's crypto and all these other things. But the point is, is that if we don't understand how we can manage our money, when you manage your money, you can manage your time. When you manage your time, then you can live the life that you were born to live opposed to feeling like I got to clock in a nine to five to keep the lights on, which takes away the majority of my energy throughout the day. I come home, I'm too tired to do anything else. You know, I don't want to figure out that one thing that I've always wanted to do as a kid. I don't have the time to do it. I don't have lack of faith in doing that. Mm -hmm. So when you own your time, you own your finances, then you're able to live the life that you've really been probably brought back here to do and continue that work and elevate our people. So my focus in creating the Crypto World Financial Sustainability Movement was to, you know, in the etymology of the word crypto is, is hidden. So when I started learning about the hidden money methodologies that right, white rich families have been using for over 200 years, the information, the game is over. Now I understand that all I need to do is apply these same principles to my finances. And this thing can create a certain level of financial freedom that our people have yet to experience in this world because we're tied to the grid. So it's really about learning about finances uh, and using this. I created this movement to, you know, putting out classes, uh, putting out the book I wrote, A Pot to Piss In, Intergenerational Wealth Planning for Black People, to have this conversation, this tabooish type of conversation about money so that we can really get on the, on the same plan of figuring out how can we really get our liberation. And it's, and it's been delayed because co uh, economics has not been part of the forefront of the conversation. No doubt. Listen, I'm going to, you know, I'm definitely going to um, jump in here with you on, on several, several points as you, as you make them, because like I said, I definitely have my own uh, perspectives, but one thing I know for sure is that money oftentimes in our community is a very uh, taboo subject. Um, even the way in which we relate to money, many of us look at money as something um, that is evil, you know, due to the scripture where he talks about, you know, the, lo the love of money is the, is the root of all evil. So I think that it's it's a subject that certainly could use um, uh, clarity. Um, one thing I want to state, though, from the beginning, because of the way that I labeled this talk is I labeled it pathways to independence for black men in America. And from my own just political perspective, um, I, and I don't know if you necessarily agree with this, but I don't particularly believe that uh, black men uh, in particular or black people in general can be uh, economically freed without some form of, uh, you know, revolution that regains us um, wealth and control and our sovereignty. That's my particular perspective. However, I do recognize that while while we are presently subjugated and dominated, money does play a significant role in our day to day. And we all have to figure out a way to earn a living while we're working to make revolution. So in that regard, um, as individual black men, there is a measure of independence that can be attained individually um, from an economic perspective. And I really that's the conversation that I want to uh, have with you tonight. I just don't want folks showing up to, to, to think that, you know, I'm preaching, you know, economics as liberation. No, I'm always on revolution. We're here in the yeah. African War College. But I do understand that the term economics, you know, if you understand the etymology of it, it just means household management, right? Managing the resources of the home, right? So finances are a critical resource of every black home. And we don't often have conversations about how to manage it, how to 
grow our wealth and how to do wealth planning. So that's why I have the brother here with me tonight. Um, because when you sent me that, uh, the clip of your book, A Pot to Piss In, and I listened to it, I'm like, man, we as black men exist within a very precarious and vulnerable position, right? We're completely dependent upon the plantation. Um, at any day, I could lose my corporate job, right? For the things that I say, you know, on the internet, very similar to you, right? I live in an economic glass house, very similarly. But you seem to be someone that have achieved that particular independence you're referring to. So that's the conversation I really want to have with you tonight. How can we as black men, like what are some things that we can do to go down that path to start to uh, develop a, 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 a bit of independent security, if not collective? Yeah, I mean, that's I mean, I agree with you what you're saying. I mean, and that's the thing is that we have not been taught really what economics is and then the power of it. Right. And. And we also kind of politicize it and seeing it as okay, there has to be this collab. And a lot of us caught into waiting for the tide to come and then join. I deal with this on an individual level, you know, because individually we have to take care of our house and home. And it's not a coincidence that uh, how to function in finance is not taught on the educational level, on any level. You know, mm -hmm. I was an econ major in college my first year, and then we didn't learn anything about money. We just learned about supply and demand. So we're not purposely taught, not just black people, but the entire, uh, the citizens of this country and probably even this world are taught in a way to not think about finances and just really go day to day. That's a, that's no coincidence that as a result, the average American person doesn't have $400 in their savings account because we haven't been taught how to manage it, in addition to being in a world full of gluttony of buying material goods that you really don't need. So for me, I try to focus on the individual. You know, when I was facing that situation where, okay, look, I've lost my job, 30 days, you know, rent, mortgage, you know, loans, uh, you know, food, all that stuff is still needs to be paid. How am I going to uh, pay for that? In addition, me being in my late 40s at the time, like, how am I going to be able to, you know, I only have but a certain window left to work. So this is affecting my savings. If I'm tapping into my savings now, this is supposed to be what I'm using when I'm 65 plus. So I try to deal with the fact that individually, we all have a number. And I broke it down as simply as this. We have what's what I like to call a FEN, a financial endurance number. This is a number that each month you have coming out of your pocket in your expenses. So you got your food bill, your gym membership, your cell phone, anything you spend money on every month is a roundabout number and it's kind of consistent every month. Um, when you multiply that number by 12 for 12 months out of the year, that is the amount of money that you will need to have to be sustainable. Mm -hmm. And I talk about sustainability before being a millionaire. Millionaire doesn't mean nothing if you don't know where to put the money. If you're sustainable, that means your expenses are taken care of. Now, now that you know what your sustainable number is, then you cross-reference that with your, your cash flow. How much money am I bringing in? And take that number that you're bringing in and subtract your expenses and see if you are in the positive or in the negative. Now, if you are in the negative, meaning that you are spending more than you are bringing in, then all you need to really do is go back and tweak some of those numbers. Maybe I'm spending too much money at the food market, or maybe I don't need to go to the club every week. Maybe I go every other week, or maybe I don't need to buy those, you know, an Xbox or the new iPhone every year. You know, you start to manage your money and think about what you need versus what you want. If you are in a positive, then you can take and understand, well, this money that I have been using, maybe I could put this money into something that is more, that will, you know, I can employ it. Because we not even we don't really realize that you're either working for money or it's working for you. And in most cases, we're working for money. So we don't know how to employ our money. And when we do, we think we put them in the wrong uh, or the, the more volatile spaces like your stock markets or your 401ks, which give you very little return, especially when they don't want you to monitor it over the 30 year span that you have it there. So for me, it's really about understanding that if I know what my FEN is versus my cash flow, then I know that I need to make, say, for instance, your FEN is $30,000. I just need to have a job or some sort of income that brings me in $30,000. Any dollar more than that, I'm rich. I can take that $1 more over that $30,000 and invest it into something or turning into something that will grow for me. But the goal is to figure out 
What are my expenses? And a lot of us don't want to look at that number because we're afraid to look at it. We get paid. We just pay the man. And we don't know how much is coming out or how much we got left. But we need to look at that. That's that very, that's that moment where we got to look in the mirror and say, hey, I'll get financial. I need to look at these numbers. We're again not taught these things. If you are taught this thing, somebody's probably throwing a $5,000 workshop for you to pay for it and they're going to carry it and not give you enough information to know how to manage this afterwards. But that's not what I'm about. You know, I'm really about trying to get as many folks as possible financially literate so that then as a community, if we want to, we can do some investments together. If you got your credit scores on, on point and your debt is, is consolidated and now you have this extra money that you want to invest in something, uh, invest with people that have money. Don't invest in broke people with broke people. Invest with people that have, uh, you know, coffers is, is like yours to invest in opportunities. Then we can address those needs that we have. And we can create those opportunities that we so desperately need instead of asking for someone else to bring something that they'll never bring. Okay. So what you've given us so far um, is the concept of FEN and cash flow and understanding, you know, what is your sustainability number, right? What do you, what do you need to have over this 12 month period to basically be able to sustain yourself at your current level uh, uh, of expenses? Hold on one second. Super chat. Brother Design the Don, uh, much appreciate, much appreciated, uh, brother, for the super chat. It says, peace to the chat on economic liberation. Appreciate you, fam. Appreciate that support. Um, so you've given us the, the sustainability number. Um, but I also know that um, within wealth planning and financial planning, you know, folks also have a retirement number, right? If, if we So if we're talking about non-traditional ways, and for those who don't know what the retirement number is, it's basically very similar to what the brother has just laid out, but it's more uh, retirement oriented. So when I retire at 50, 55, 60, 65, how much income do I need to have coming in um, on a monthly basis post retirement to cover my way of life? Right. So the goal is then while I'm actually working and and and, and earning a living and making income, I should be putting um, that money away. So that when I retire, that'll be the money that um and I and, and I recognize that you're you're saying in terms of vehicles where that money gets put 401k may not necessarily be the best vehicle. So um I certainly be interested to to hear more um on that perspective. But um I guess the question I have is could you speak a bit more about uh the independence perspective, right? Because like you said, when you left from your job, you didn't go um and find another uh plantation to become a part of. And when I heard you speak recently, you talked about black people getting caught up into all these uh, get rich quick schemes, right? The flowers and, you know, yeah. the, the, the fake susus and things like that. Like, could you, could you speak to like ways in which you could earn a living to actually hit that sustainability number, but also that retirement number? Yeah. Um, you know, that's the thing too, is if we have to have to add to that is that the cost of inflation, you know, is that, you know, the, the, especially if you live in urban areas, which most of us, most of us live in, and we're in gentrified spaces where cost of living is going up just because, you know, white folks want to move back into our neighborhoods. Those are also things that we need to think about. There is a migration back down to the South happening for a reason. And it isn't because of jobs. It's because the cost of living is getting higher. So we have to factor those things in too, as far as when you're thinking about the future. Uh, but in regards to uh, the, the planning of it all, you know, for me, it's, it's really, um, I did my diligence in understanding, okay, I learned from experience too. We also understand you've been here for long enough. You can learn from your experiences. And when we had that last market crash of, or the, uh, in 2008 and nine, the housing market crash, you know, I personally lost $250,000 out of my 401k and not being aware of what that is. I thought it was a fluke. I thought it was a once in a lifetime thing. Um, but once I learned and did, did some research, when I was writing this book, Apop the Piss In, um, I learned that recessions are planned. So when you understand that this is a systemic plan, a systemic game that is put in place for us to uh, really not uh, prosper, unless you know these specific little tools that you can use, which are not inherently passed down or shared with other ethnicities until we've come to the information age, then you will follow the same uh, path of inherited uh, struggle, inherited depravity. Um, so when I learned that the market, stock market, the average person 
who uh, puts money in the stock market for 40 years, if they let that sit for 40 years, you're going to get an average of a 1.8% return mm. on your on your investment. If you're putting your money in a savings account, you know, you're going to get maybe 1% if it's over ten thousand dollars that you save in there, a lot of us have a hard time again just putting keeping four hundred. So the system that's set up for us is not made for us to to excel. Also, because we haven't been taught about how to just manage money in regards to wants versus needs. So for me, it's really about, uh, and I, I know I'm probably getting away from the com- the question you asked. No, about go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. You good? You good? But um, you know, for me, it's more important about looking at present what you're doing with your money. Then future as far as like, yeah, what is that number that you want to get to when you want to retire? Well, a lot of that can be based upon whatever your debt is, your debt ratio. If you have a house you're paying for, Super you're going to have to keep a job. You're going to have to keep a job until you pay that house off, right? Hold on one second. So, hold on one second. Yes, sir. Um, brother uh, Rebulba, the, oh, um, sister Rebulba, the obvious girl, um, appreciate the support. Super chat. Word, I like that <laughs> word. But, um, you know, having that, looking at uh, the planning of how what you're doing with your finances is I really, I think I got off tangent here. Um, help me out, brother. What were we talking about again? I got, we I got we, we were talking about the, the, the planning, the retirement planning. You were saying over a lifetime, most people only get 1.8% back on their 401k or 1% if it's just sitting in the savings. Yeah. And that's the thing is looking at the models that are available to us that these aren't the ones that we should be looking into. Definitely vet them and see, okay, is this, what type of average return do you get in a 401k or what do you Mm -hmm. get in the stock market, et cetera? But what else is out there? And one of the things that I learned that's out there is whole life insurance um, and the type of compounded interest returns you get on whole life insurance. And then we're in a tech space where, you know, cryptocurrency is giving you four, five, six figure return on investments if you know how to do it. The problem is, is that we get caught up into FOMO, fear of missing out. So the first time we hear about somebody talking about it, we don't know if the market is high or low and we're putting in money. And if we don't like it within the week, we're trying to pull out because we're not doing the diligence of understanding what investing is. Part of growing wealth is understanding what investment is and then deciding, are you doing short term, mid term or long term uh, investments? A lot of us are saying that we want to build something for the long term, but because short term ain't performing the way we want to, we're ready to liquidate. And then we have it puts a bad taste in our mouth if it doesn't go the way we want to. So we, then we don't we do away with it and miss those type of opportunities. But there's a plethora of opportunities now, again, thanks to the information age, that information is out there to learn about. And I also share this in my courses, in my book, and in my talks about how we can create that sort of uh, to free yourself the rat race, fire your boss before they fire you because every no one's job is theirs forever. You know, eventually you're going to get fired, laid off, and if you're lucky, you'll retire. But even then, the money that you've put away and haven't monitored, if you don't monitor the money you're putting away right now in your 401k or your stock mark stocks or whatnot, if you don't, if you're not, and you come back to 65, you don't know what type of volatility the savings and losses you've had. So again, yeah, no this doubt. Is what the markets play on. Go ahead, brother. No doubt. I mean, we, we saw that in 2008 with the market crash. You know, black right. black families, black people who had their money housed in 401ks. I mean, we lost a significant um, amount of our, of, our, of, of, of our wealth. Yeah, ex- exactly. I don't know what the exact number is, but I know, I mean, black people took a significant hit. So I guess my, my question becomes like, uh, what are those um, instruments, right? Those wealth building instruments that you would recommend all black people looking into learning about and and using to develop and build wealth over a long term period, right? Because I think you, you you mentioned the word FOMO, right? Fear of missing out. And the psychology of wealth, I don't think even a lot of black people have it, right? You said something that was dope in an interview I was listening to. You talked about a lot of black people are used to fourth quarter opportunities. And when you said that, it struck a chord with me, right? Because I remember back in 2010, 2011, I I had the opportunity to do um, uh, an experiential learning opportunity out in Silicon Valley where I was learning about... um, you know, um, venture back companies, how to raise venture funding, how to start tech companies and all these things. And then it's like 
four or five years later, the entire black community is now talking about this and everybody's getting into, you know, raising venture funds. And I'm like, man, it's like, we're always late. Same thing with like crypto. Um, mm -hmm. I knew um, colleagues who got into crypto in like 2011, 2012, right? I didn't get into it, but I knew colleagues who did. And now they're exiting in 2018, 2019, 2020. And now everybody in black America is talking about crypto, but it's more from a like, a gambling perspective, right? You, you, I know you're familiar with investing versus speculation. So now everything is about speculation. Like if you get in and it goes up to this, then you'll hit that. And I'm like, man, like we can't keep playing this type of rat race, get rich quick game. And I feel like because black people desire, um, I saw Bomani put in the chat, somebody got him on one of those flower fig susu things, right? Because black people desire something for nothing, something for nothing or something very quick. Like we're easily predisposed to these fourth quarter schemes in which basically all the you know all the good money is already out at that point but i want you to go ahead and speak on that i mean that that's the thing about it is that you know as, as you said is you know we pretty much are you know we go on the fly or something and it feels good but then you know once you get to it we don't even know we're getting to it's usually you know word of mouth and we don't do the diligence if we guard to take or someone else's to us not knowing what this true opportunity brings and that's where we've been gotten again, because, you know, again, conversations about talking about money. We don't know how to really have that real conversation, because usually if it does, especially with our families, it'll end up, you know, in an argument because somebody owe you money from five years ago. They ain't paid you that twenty dollars back because we don't we have these small conversations because we're afraid to really talk about the bigger spectrum of things. And that's where we get intimidated and we're intimidated because no one wants to talk about how broke they are. You know, mm -hmm. no one wants to talk about, you know, how, how they're struggling, even though we know we all are. And that's where I feel like this space of really um, having these intentful conversations about money, um, about what your needs are, and understanding that can each of us have our own number. Each of us has our own FEN, you know, and beside the FEN, each of us has our own spending habits. You know, each of us needs to be disciplined in the fact that, OK, this is what am I wasting money on versus what could I be saving that money for? So I've had my share of even with crypto. I got involved in 2015 um, with crypto and I jumped in because on the on the, you know, on the strength of my brethren that was telling me about it, didn't know anything about it. And I got in blindly. Then I said, wait a minute, I need to actually spend some time. And the rich people had this rule. I always talk. I tell this to my to my clients. They have this rule called the five hour rule. And it's basically if you're not spending five hours a week learning about finances, you're being irresponsible. Mm. So five hours a week is 42 and a half minutes a day if you did it every day for seven days a week. If you spent a minimum of that time a week, five hours, we spend more time throughout the week uh, decompressing from work, <laughs> you know, detoxifying from that toxic you know, working in, in working a job we don't like or, we're, you know, we went to college to get this degree and we're not even working in that field, in that space, still paying off college loans and we're in our 40s and 50s. So and, and still worried about losing our job if we speak up about anything because they were overworking us. And I'm well due over a promotion. But if I say something, I might get laid off or they're going to bring in somebody younger than me, which I need to talk about the job space as well, because the job market is not producing jobs anymore. Yeah. So, you know, that's putting things in jeopardy. If we talk about artificial intelligence, that's what's taking over those jobs. It isn't immigrants. You know, mm -hmm. if we are going to get certified for jobs that aren't even there and we are still left with holding a bag of debt. But these are the conversations that we've been told this old model of getting an education, getting that degree as high as you can. And then there's this job waiting for you. The six figure job is a Wizard of Oz complex. It is not there. It's not real. So when you hit that reality of understanding that 70% of baristas at, at uh, Starbucks have bachelor degrees, they didn't go to college to want to work at Starbucks, but they got to keep the lights on. So we have been disillusioned in thinking if we get the certification as WB Du Bois talk about the talented tent, going to get educated, then you'll be accepted. Those jobs aren't here anymore. They're being replaced by automation. So we need to actually figure out how we can create wealth on our own using different space that's where conversation comes in to figure out in the space of financial literacy first 
managing your own habits. It starts with what are you what's coming out of your pocket. And if you can understand what that is and get a hold of that, then you can learn how to monetize the remaining or even put it into other pockets. Like I mentioned, uh, whole life insurance is one, crypto is another. There's a couple of other things in blockchain technology. These are not fourth quarter opportunities. These are first quarter opportunities still. Cryptocurrency is still a first quarter opportunity. It's just that we can't buy the Dogecoin because Elon Musk says so. We need to understand what the Dogecoin is so we don't lose money in the process. It comes with diligence. It comes with that five-hour rule that I'm speaking of. All right. Um, I have to share this really quick. Let me, um, because I think it'll be a good conversation to have. So a good a good friend of mine, <laughs> uh, Dr. Jared Ball. Are you familiar with Dr. Jared Ball at all? No, he wrote, he wrote the book, The Myth of Black Buying Power. Um, and um, it's the, so if you're not familiar with him, he wrote, he wrote a book called The Myth of Black uh, Black Buying Power. And um, he's basically in the book, he's making the argument that the so-called, you know, every year this report comes out um, referring to the purchasing power in the black community where he says, where it says black Americans have 1.4 trillion or, you know, 1.3 trillion in spending power. Like he basically does an entire book to talk about how that pot of money is a myth that doesn't exist. So if you're into finance or economics, you should definitely go check him out. Um, but I was listening to him do a talk one day earlier this year, and um, he used the uh, the Godfather when uh, when Vito said to Michael, uh, "The one who comes to you with the with the, with the peace deal or, or or the meeting is the traitor." So he says, "The one that comes to you talking about financial literacy like is the traitor." Right. So <laughs> I want to I want to have this conversation because for me that's that's actually pretty hilarious, but. Um, and all seriousness, the things that you just laid out, and I talk about this a lot in terms of the fourth industrial revolution, um, uh, this economy currently is bleeding jobs that will not be replaced. Artificial intelligence is a thing. The brightest minds are promoting what's referred to as universal basic income, but me as a Garveyite, I view that as slavery. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, we still have to figure out how, how we will meet our economic needs in a new economic reality where you cannot sell your labor into a labor market to earn a wage income. If that is going to be the case for a significant amount of people, and your from your perspective, um, because financial literacy is one thing, but if you're not earning in the first place, it doesn't do too much for you, right? You have to have finances to even manage or be, you know, like, like how do we meet that challenge? Like, what are some tools? I don't care if it's cooperative economics. I don't care if there's certain like economic or financial instruments that you would recommend. Like, what are some things that you would say uh, we should be doing both individually and collectively to prepare for this new economic reality? Yeah, you know, the, the thing is, um, I even do a double take on myself when I say these things to myself and thinking about that very question um, is that when we think about, uh, I have this complex that I want to save everybody. I want to mm -hmm. save all our and exclusively. I want to, if I can liberate all African people of the United States and then globally, that is my plight. That is my goal. Mm -hmm. But I also understand, as Harriet said, you know, hey, not everybody don't even think they're slaves. Not everybody wants to be free. Not everybody wants to go the route that I'm trying to create. You know what I mean? It's, everybody can, you know, you're, you're free to, to travel the route you want to, the uh, path you want to uh, go. But my thing is, um, I'm really trying to work on the individual first, because if I can help you handle your personal situation and get you in a position where your debt is consolidated, that your home is paid off of, or at least you have a plan of action in doing it. And maybe you don't have a job because really no job is guaranteed, as I mentioned. So you might have a job now, but you might not have a job on Monday. Some people mm -hmm. are going to show up tomorrow and get laid off. So what do you do if you still have that window? And if you don't have a job, then what can you do to create some sort of income? Another way is, you know, using credit as a tool. In America, credit is king. 
I hold one second. Hold on one second. Yo, check this out. Run my uncle Moel his likes. Family, if y'all in the building, please make sure y'all hit the like button. Uh, please make sure that y'all share, um, engage in the chat. Somebody has already said that this topic needs to be a series. I mean, and I agree, right? Financial education is certainly important. Um, if we, if you're earning, um, you want to know what to do with your situation so that you are properly planning for yourself and your family. And if you're not earning, maybe this will help you to think about ways, um, non-traditional ways that you can earn, right? How can how can we develop those opportunities to bridge the gap? How can we work together collectively to have our economic needs met until, you know, we get to that point where that transformation truly happens, right? Because you already know that's what I'm, I'm all about, the full tra transformation, full revolution, because that's the only solution collectively that i see but for the individual again which is what tonight's topic is focused on you might learn something if you're listening um and i'm hoping our brother uh he, he's about to go right now and he's giving us some on, on credit the importance of credit so he's starting to give you some 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 nuggets some instruments that you can use as an individual so definitely pull out your notepad um take notes and i'll let y'all come up at, at about the 50 minute mark and y'all can ask the brother questions as well yeah so you know with with that's something that, you know, I like to call it OPP, OPM rather, <laughs> other people's money. Um, and using that as a way to uh, use other people's money to get the things that you need. And a sidebar is the 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 for the, the focus of all this, the foundation of all of this, and I've seen some of these some of the things and mentions in the chat, really it's a basic basic need of water, shelter, and food. Mm -hmm. These are the basic things that we need more than anything else. You know what I mean? Money, you can't eat money. So we understand that. So how about my my drive is to create an opportunity where I can bring in money that allows Super me chat. to pay for those three necessities. Because right now we're grid-based. You know, if the community, if, if uh, the trucks don't come into our communities and we don't have food because we don't have community gardens, we don't know how to uh, capture water nor to clean it. So those are, that's another opportunity. So we should be storing water. Um, you know, the shelter piece is another piece. We don't have to worry about clothes because, you know, we're living in post uh, COVID. So a lot of us are like cartoon characters wearing the same thing every day. So clothes ain't a big thing right now, but those things are, we should be focused on my drive. So vertical gardening is important. Learning how to, you know, garden, don't have a backyard, look into doing vertical garden or hyper, um, um, aquaponics. There are different ways that you can grow food to take care of yourself. Now, coming back to the credit game is that uh, if you have, this is what's really interesting about the credit game, um, and you may or may not know this, but if you do have credit, you do have credit cards, a lot of us don't know that you can get more money on those cards. Now, we think, well, I don't want to use credit because it's a debt, right? And I have to pay this thing off. Well, if you're using credit as a way to attain the things that need, you need to sustain yourself, then you can use it in a positive way. Of course, you don't want to go to Cancun on credit, but you can certainly buy, you know, uh, you know, some sort of mechanism that allows you to grow your own food, or you could easily use it, use it to where you can purchase land with credit. Um, you can turn that personal credit into business credit, and you can use that business credit to purchase even larger things if you want to as an individual. And then if you get with other people that are doing the same thing, then you have a collaborative and you can do even larger things. But credit is something that is underestimated, in my opinion, about what you can do with it. You can go from a few hundred dollars a month if you do what's called credit line increases, which you can do four on each card per year, 90 days apart, you can grow that credit limit exponentially 100% every year if you take care of it, if you pay off what you're purchasing. But at the same time, you got to use the credit. So there are definitely, um, for me, I think credit is a way to supplement income. Yes, you do have to have a way to pay it off. But again, if I'm looking to purchase something that my job will never pay me enough to be able to save to get, then I can use credit as an alternative to attain that thing. And then the goal is for me to, again, get off the plantation. So we need to be having a, a strategic plan about what is our goal in life and what is that monetary number. And then once you get to that monetary number, however you get it, you liquidate it and get it. I can use crypto as an example as well. I mean, people are using cryptocurrency and they're being happy with having these digital portfolios. But if you know the power, the power grid goes out, it's electric money. You can't use it. So you should be thinking about 
What is your exodus? What is your liquidation plan? If you don't have a liquidation plan, maybe they won't need it. You need that strategic, and it's not something you just, you could talk about in conversation. It's that five hour rule that needs to be implemented to understand what the strategy is. All right. So if someone is watching this video tonight and they do not have a pot to piss in, what are five things that they can do immediately to start building wealth or to start to change around their financial reality? I know sometimes people say it takes money to make money, right? So I don't know if you can, nothing for nothing leaves nothing, right? Yeah, You've right. been given two so far, right? You've talked about financial literacy. Um, you've talked about um, credit and credit related opportunities. What are, what are, what are three like real tangible uh, things? Or for, for an example, you were laid off in 2018 um, from the NBA or after 2017. Yeah. What were some of those things that you did to gain your economic independence that other folks can employ as well? Okay. So fortunately, I had put away money in my 401k. Mm -hmm. And I, again, did it because everybody else was doing it and didn't really monitor it, didn't really understand it. I was, I know I was getting matched. So I was getting 6% on what I put in. So that was, I was happy about that. But um, I really didn't even know how much was in there. But when I got laid off, I knew that I needed a couple, some time to figure out what I was going to do next because I knew I wasn't trying to go back to the plantation. Mm -hmm. But when I went to, it was at Fidelity and I went to pull out money out of my, um, my account, uh, the thing that really got me was as I was speaking with the, the representative, the broker, I had told him when you want to pull out money and you can't pull out money if you're under 59 and a half, but you'll get taxed. Mm -hmm. In New York City, you get taxed five times. I didn't know that. So I got hit as much money as I pulled out. I didn't get a lot of it because a lot of it went to taxes. However, I said, you know what? I got enough in it. I need to hold me off for a couple of months. But what really got me was when I was filling out the application to pull out the money. And I had to list my occupation. And I said, well, damn, I'm laid off. I'm unemployed. I don't want to put that there. That doesn't make sense. So what this white boy told me. Well, yeah, don't put that there. Put that you live off your savings and investments. And when I put that as my occupation, it changed, literally it changed the way I saw money mm. because I realized, wow, this is how white boys live. They live off their savings and investments. They employ their money. So to speed it up for anyone that's looking for that, how do I live off my savings and investments? is you need to learn how to employ your money where it's going to give you a higher return. Bank accounts going to give you maybe one and a half percent on a good day. Uh, stock market, 1.8%, 401k, depending on if there's a recession or not. If it's lost, it's not replenished. So those are out the window for me. But what I did look into was, again, as I mentioned, I said a whole lot they give returns of uh, compounded interest. So you want to look for opportunities that offers compounded interest. Compounded interest is a conversation a lot of us don't know about. Compounded hold on interest. Yeah. Hold on one second. Uh, family for y'all. He said whole life insurance. You you broke up a little bit when, when oh, you were speaking. Bad. So I just want to make sure they, they capture that. He said whole life insurance is one of those vehicles. And now he's talking about compounded interest, the benefits of having a whole life insurance. So go ahead, brother. You can keep going. What's going on, Sister A.Y.? Sister A.Y., our dean of the African War College, our provost is in the building. Our resident CPA is here for the financial talk. So that's what's up. Shout out to you, Sister A.Y. Yeah. Um, well, just to give some backdrop about what whole life does is whole life is not like term life. Mm -hmm. Term life is it is for a certain amount of time, 10 years, 15 years, 30 years. And we bank on that. Actually, uh, people of Africa, United States, high Term life insurance policies of all ethnicities. So we are mm. investing in insurance, life insurance, but it's the wrong one, in my opinion. Term life means that in 15 years, if you haven't died in 15 years, you get nothing. Your family mm. gets nothing. So what you've been doing is giving these insurance companies money for 15 years and trust they're taking this money and they're investing it in to make money for themselves. Mm -hmm. So term means that it is a certain term. And then when that term is over, you're not insured. And what we turn around and do is we get insured again. So we'll do another 10 or 15 and hope. And that's a, that's the gamble. We're telling, we're betting on them that we're going to die within this amount of time. And so when I do give this money to my family, right? But they're saying after they vet you, have you go through um, insurance, uh, going through a physical and all that kind of stuff to see if you're the worthy candidate. Now, yes, you can get hit by a bus tomorrow, 
But if your health is intact, you can't have any preconditioning, pre-existing conditions or they won't give you a policy. Mm-hmm. Now, I saw that someone just said, well, whole life insurance is more expensive. Here's the benefit of whole life insurance. So, yes, it is more expensive. However, it does give you a bank. Uh, a, it gives you a cash vault coffer. So when you're putting money away in your insurance policy, part of that also goes into a cash vault. This cash vault grows over time. They have what's called a dividend rider. If you put in money, it depends on if you're with a mutual life company. You have to be with a mutual life, whole life insurance company. It has to be mutual. So you're more of a shareholder. You're not a stockholder. So when the company makes money at the end of the year, they share the dividend payouts to everyone that has a policy. So for instance, I'm with New York Life. If you're with New York Life, you're going to get 6% match on your dividend rider, which is anything extra that you put into your policy. In addition to the fact that a whole life policy gives you a guaranteed state-by-state 4% return. That's double what a bank account gives you, triple Mm -hmm. what the stock market will give you. So you're already starting off good by having a whole life insurance policy. Now, when the compounded interest kicks in, that's when you're putting in money. And like a susu that should be run is you let the money stay there. You put it back in. You don't pull it out. You keep it and let it grow. Over time, you'll start to see that the compounded interest kicks in. And by the fifth to 10th year, you're going to see this huge climb in the in the amount of value in that compounded interest policy. So now you can pull this money and loan it to yourself. You can come your own bank. Instead of me to go to a commercial bank asking for a loan and and be uh and, and have to experience racism because of my color, because we still have to pay higher in our uh in our APR because of our color alone. And this has been studied, it's still out there. Black people put more in all types of types of services and banking services. Is that now you can become your own bank. And now you can, and this is what the Rockefellers have done. The Rockefellers have multiple mutual life, whole life insurance policies spread out amongst their whole family. They have over 150 family members, and each of them have multiple whole life insurance policies. That's how Chase Manhattan Bank was created because they had so much money that now they could loan it out to other people. Uh, so we well, have the members that are there. Go ahead, bro. So, so all wealth, right? There's an initial accumulation of, of, of capital, right? For example, the the wealth that the US is found is founded on is the accumulation that came from slavery, right? Um, when you look at the Rockefellers in terms of how that wealth was ac- acquired. Nothing about it was was legal, right? So I, I don't want to. Yeah, you, er, er, everything that that Rockefeller did is actually considered, and there's a reason why they have like antitrust laws and monopoly laws and all these things in place now, because basically everything he did was 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 criminal. It was it was Rico, right? But yeah. that was then, you know, it was like a, it was like the gold rush. It was like the frontier, right? You could you could get away with. I- illegality right mm-hmm. but for those who because the majority of people watching this are going to be nine to five wage earners or day-to-day hustlers right the people who are watching this and what i want them to walk away with from this conversation are what are some wealth producing assets or opportunities they can think about that can start to move them towards individual economic and in- independence right so so far i think we have three you know, things that can be done. You talked about financial literacy. You talked about uh, using credit as a tool or an instrument. You talked about uh, whole life uh, insurance. If you can just give us two more that you highly recommend um, our people to have, because it was, it was interesting that you said uh, not the stock market, because I did when I was an undergrad, um, I helped to start an investment club and the folks in Berkshire Hath- Hathaway came in. That's uh, Warren Buffett's group. Mm-hmm. They came in and t- kind of like taught us the investment strategy, right? How to develop an investment strategy rather. Um, we had to read, of course, the, you know, intelligent investor. Um, so Buffett's book, right? So these are things I'm familiar with. So I know that Buffett is very bullish on stocks, but bullish on stocks that he are companies or wealth producing companies that have wealth producing assets that he understands. So from that perspective, like, are there two must haves that as a black family, right? I have a household here. I have to have, and should be looking into in terms of using my five hours a week 
and learning more about to help me get on that path to kind of like economic independence. And the last thing I want you to speak on after that, and I'll come back and remind you, is if you could talk about the difference between economic independence versus economic sustainability, because you can sustain yourself on this system while you're attached to it. Mm. But you're not necessarily independent. You're still dependent. So if you could talk about that, that'd be helpful as well. So um, what about Buffett too, that Buffett has also made a lot of his billions using no life insurance policies by buying policies. So he, he'll he say one thing. You have your Susie Ram Dave Ramsey's and Susie Orman's that also talk about term life insurance. And this is where you put your 401k. But on the low, they're making money using whole life insurance policies. Again, this is arbitrage. Mm -hmm. Arbitrage is a term that, you know, People that don't want strategies third what they're going to make their money. They don't want to share that with the public because then you won't need them, right? Mm. So arbitrage is something that I would add to, you know, the study list of understanding the money methods that are used uh, commercially that are promoted aren't necessarily the ones that are really making the money that we're looking for. So mm. the last two, the, the last two I would say is, um, I, I you know, I've talked about crypto. Um, and just the understanding of it and not getting doing dealing it with it from a FOMO perspective, mm -hmm. you know, not buying because now Bitcoin is at 66,000 that you should be buying. If you're not in the game, yes. But if you're already in the game, you shouldn't be buying at 66,000. You should be waiting when it goes low. Um, and that's the thing is that we need to know when, uh, when it's the right time to buy certain things. I'm not saying that, you know, for me, stock market don't work for me. Mm -hmm. 401ks don't work for me mainly because I understand that recessions are tied to these things. I understand that political moves around the world are tied to my savings. If I put my, my future savings, if I keep it there. When Trump caught COVID uh, you know, a few years ago, the Dow, the Dow Jones dropped 500 points. So the actions of one person could have a detrimental effect to your future. Mm -hmm. That's something that I don't want to put my money in, especially at this stage in my life. I don't have the time. To waste 30 years. Um, someone says it's way too late for Bitcoin. I don't think it is. Um, there's still 2.1 million Bitcoins left uh, that you can purchase. And the value, if you look at the ticker, you can see how the value has been growing. Last year, this time, Bitcoin wasn't even 30 grand or 40,000. So I'm not saying that, um, you know, we, we get tabooish about or we get our speculations, as you mentioned before, Speculations is what drives a lot of things, but you also got to do the diligence and looking at the ticker. Look at these stocks. And even if you want to stay in stock markets, look at the behavior, study the candlesticks and see how does it behave last week, three months, six months, a year ago. That gives you projections of where it's going. Mm -hmm. But if we're just going there blindly because you heard someone say it on the Internet or some YouTube commercial, then, yeah, you're going to probably take a loss because you don't know what you're doing. You know, but that's where the responsibility and the diligence of the five hour rule comes into play. Reading and, um, you know, and, and following folks that speak to you um, is probably something that I would, you know, don't she that you think risky. And I'm going off of what sister I was saying, you know, I'm just saying it real time. Uh, but everything is a risk because wherever you put your money, nothing's guaranteed. As I mentioned, you don't even know the value of it's going to be. The dollar right now is worth four cents. So what does that mean for the price of the dollar when you're in 20 years trying to retire? You know, mm. it, lining up with, with lining it up with the cost of living. So that's why I say don't get caught up into what you're going to have when you retire. By the time you retire, have the things you need in place. Have that home paid for. Have that garden already, uh, you know, um, already on flex. Having these things already in operation so that you can self-define if you need to. You know, that's the goal. And uh, I forgot the last question you, you wanted me to ask. You said um, I wanted you to speak to the difference between economic sustainability versus economic yes. and independence. Yeah. Um, again, opinionated um, is, you know, we are part of the system. I don't want to be part of the system, um, but in order for us to create a new system, uh, we have to coexist in this system so we, till we can create another one. So that's for me is why it's important that we are looking at what are we uh, having these conversations about? One, let's get ourselves in a position where we're financially sustainable, meaning that my expenses are taken care of, meaning that I've even fired my boss because I have my passive income covering my FEN. Mm. That's the next phase is that you have producing income that covers all of your expenses and you're being diligent about 
what is frivolous versus what you don't need. So when we get those things locked down, then and you have a sort of income that's coming in that covers that, then you have the time to sit back and be what I like to taunt corner for a phrases. And Steve Coakley talked about this being a futurologist. We're not futurologists. We don't think about our future. We don't plan. We think about it, but we don't plan our future. We need to have those think tanks that are talking about planning these futures. This future that we're trying to build, we got to, the big elephant in the room is what are we going to have to do to defend it? You know, what type of military presence do we create to defend? Because every time black people want to try to build something, somebody's going to try to come and take it. Mm -hmm. So we need to also have that conversation, but we can't do it off of emotion and we can't do it off of having no dollars behind it to finance it. Mm -hmm. You know, that's the conversation that I think is something that you get to once a person has proven, okay, look, financially, I'm astute. I'm okay. I can take care of myself. Now I'm ready to invest in the community and do some things collaboratively. But we cannot continue to invest in people with just ideas and no finances behind it because it just continues to continue to be just talk. All right, my brother. <laughs> Listen, uh, you wrote a book, Pot to Piss In. Um, I think you're a four-time author at this point, I believe. Five. Five. I'm, 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 my bad, my brother. You know, I'm, I'm on my road to being a first-time <laughs> author. So whenever I got a black male author, a black author in general, um, but my channel Whenever I have a black male author, you know, I want to salute yeah, um, thanks. Tell folks where they can uh, find out more about you, uh, the, the crypto woke movement. Um, and what inspired you to write your last book? And if folks in the chat, if y'all want to come up and ask Brother Mwebe a question, I just dropped the link into the chat so y'all can join. But, yeah, tell folks where they can find more about your book. If you have courses or information that they that, that they can learn um you can you know share all that information now okay uh in regards to finances um you can go to my site crypto woke movement.com crypto woke movement.com um there you can also find a link uh about my latest book a pot to piss in intergenerational wealth planning uh for black people and the, that book is pretty much uh covers a lot of what we you know what we spoke about tonight in addition to some other tricks um, but for the most part, this is really, uh, if we look at the etymology of that phrase, you don't have, a, you're so poor, you don't have a pot to piss in or one to throw it out of, but that's something that we've inherited. Um, because back in the day, you didn't have, you know, uh, water pipes, sewage, uh, toilet, toilets and stuff of that nature. You basically relieved yourself in the pot and you threw it out the window or you walked it out the door. Mm -hmm. Well, we were so poor that we didn't even own the ground we, we stood on. So you definitely didn't have a pot to piss in. So that was became a moniker of, of poverty, whereas having a pot in your house was a level of civility, you know, and that you basically seem to be like a person that was a certain level of status. So now me finding out about these things that I've learned that have been systemically put in place to counter using arbitrage measures, keeping the majority of people at poverty level and not being able to create wealth, learning these things, I now realize that we have a pot to piss in. So I put these things in this book to show us different ways to create intergenerational wealth 70 years into the future, being that futurologist and having that money being willed down to generations that aren't even here now. And also being able to uh, speed up your exodus out of the rat race and fire your boss before they fire you. Mm. Uh, another site I have is called theghettotimes.com. That's D-A-G-H-E-T-T-O-T-Y-M-Z. We can see some of my other books. Uh, the other book you can see here is Who is Blay? And it basically talks about America's first black fraternity. Um, uh, can you, can you say that? You were, you were breaking up when you said it. If you want to hold the book up to the uh, screen or whatever, you yeah. were breaking up when you said it, so I couldn't hear you. Yeah. So this is this is the first book, uh, Pop the Piss In, uh, Intergenerational Wealth Planning for Black People. Mm -hmm. That's the first one. And this is uh, this is my third book, uh, Who is the Boule? And this is the history of America's first black fraternity and the uh, and the derailment towards African liberation. While we find that, you know, these elite talented 10th organizations that we've been celebrating over 100 years, not just Greeks, but NAACP, Urban League, all these organizations were put in place for a specific reason. And that is to delay the liberation of black people taking on the likes of Garveyism and doing for self. Uh, so I did a historical analysis of the organization. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I saw you. I saw you uh, drop Steve Coakley's name earlier. Absolutely. Shout out, rest in peace to the ancestor Steve Coakley, right? the, the, the gay boule. Right? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's bigger than that. 
Yeah, you know, no, I know, I know, but I'm just with that that terminology. You know yeah. what I mean? Um, yeah. That for, for me, um, I t- people, I I was a non traditional student. Right. I went back to school when I was, what, 23, 24, right, to go mm-hmm. and get my degree. Mm-hmm. And like when I was in school, I was somewhat of a rock star. So a lot of the um, fraternities wanted to recruit me. Mm-hmm. And I just remembered Steve Coakley and I said, nah, fam, I ain't man, rock star. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm good. I, mean, I appreciate, you know, but I'm going to be a leader on my own over here. I, I can't. I can't. Well, rock. I did that life. I, I did that life. I was an alpha for a minute. And mm-hmm. then when I learned about what I learned, I realized I couldn't ride the fence. And I tried to change from within, and they wasn't having it. So I said, okay, I, I get it now. You know, this is what you guys are based upon. You want to be this, and and I'm not that. So I didn't go out quietly. And uh, this book evolved from that. And it, you know, basically gives other people to see the flip side of the coin. Because we think that, you know, all of these Black organizations that have been here have been, we talk about the, the progress we've had. Well, mm-hmm. you know, they say we've come so far, but we still so have so far much far to go. And why is that? You know, and and who's setting the pace? You know what I'm saying? These are the conversations that we, the next questions we don't ask that I address in this book. Yeah, well, if you ever read, um, I think that's uh, Machiavelli's The Prince, mm-hmm. right? He says, you know, when you, when you're, I'm paraphrasing here, but like when you're pursuing revolution, You'll have as an enemy all those who benefited well under the last regime and a friend, all those who were not. Right. So those black people who are in space and are doing extremely well under the system that is impressing the majority, oppressing the majority of us like they have no interest and or desire to see this thing torn down. Right. So those people are going to inform on you. Those people are going to build organizations to be the protectors of the king. Right. The, the keepers of the king. Like that's just what they they're going to do. And you have to un- understand that. So I like the fact that you pointed to the fact that those folks are put in place to delay and prevent our uh, liberation, you know, as, as black people. I see we have Brother Dean in the back. Looks like he wants to come up and ask a question. So I'm going to bring you up uh, to the to, to the stream. Uh, welcome, Brother Dean. Welcome to the stream. How are you? Hey, am I coming in clear? I, I'm realizing my video is not so good. It's all good. We, we see your, uh, yeah, Andrew. Yeah. So, so what's going on, my brother? Yeah, sorry. I'm driving and um, my boy's in the background. So forgive me if you hear any noise. But I had a question, you know, this was a great stream because I personally am invested in this conversation about black men doing better and and economic independence. And um, I guess my question is, because I believe in academia and I think that there is a pathway to, I don't know, maybe maybe not economic independence, but uh, a pathway to um, building communities through education and um i i, I come from I'm, I'm jamaican i'm you know first generation jamaican right and academics is heavily kind of preached in my family and it's done wonders for my family so i guess my question to the brother is um how, how does he feel about that i know what he mentioned about with the, with the you know marcus garvey and doing it for self but how does he feel about that in the modern context Well, I'll tell you, I'm not against education at all. Um, What I'm against is the system that's put in place where it's now really you're paying. It's a it's a business. It's not even an educational system now. It's a business. You know, tuition is much higher than it used to be when I went to college. And it's putting people in debt because unlike, you know, pro football or the NBA, where they have these farm leagues, when you graduate, there is no job that's waiting for you. There are. Uh, three and a half uh, million college five high school graduates every year. Okay, that's 8.5 million graduates in the educational sector looking for work now or either trying to get higher learning to get higher paying jobs. But there's only on a good year, two million jobs being created in this country. Mm-hmm. So how can 8.5 million people, newly mint graduates, find work that only offers two million? And we're not even talking about the current people that are in the job space that are losing jobs and trying to find new work as well. So the, I'm, what I'm speaking about is people are going to get educated for a job that's not there. So it's not to say don't go get your degree, definitely network while you're there, et cetera. But think about 
What is it that you, why are we, <laughs> this is even better. There's a rule, a riddle. What's the strangest thing you spent money on, ever spent a lot of money on? And the answer is, it's rhetorical, is that I, I, I apply for a loan to go to college so I can get a job to pay off the loan. A lot of us are going to college thinking that it's going to guarantee that six-figure job, and it's just not there. So why not understand what money is? There's a known fact that folks that don't go to college actually have le lesser debt than folks that do go to college. A lot of the millionaires in this country don't even have college degrees, very little even have high school degrees. It's not saying not having a degree doesn't, having a degree doesn't make you smart. OK, it is let's makes it known that we've been trained to be to apply for certain levels of income jobs. But it doesn't mean that those jobs are guaranteed to be there. So I'm not talking against education and educating yourself, but understand understanding money and how you can manage money is just as I think even more important. Now, if you understand how you can manage money, then you could be better off and, not, and have lesser debt. That's basically what I'm saying. Well, one second. Hold on. I'm going to let the brother follow up one second real quick. I appreciate uh that question uh family if you are here for the first Yo, time check this out run my uncle Moel his like please hit that like button please subscribe to the channel uh we have omawali after dark every sunday at 8 p.m um i'm i'm, I'm very fortunate to to have this brother brother and Webe here with us tonight uh somebody just mentioned in the chat they said wow this is the brother who writes the ghetto times first <laughs> time i heard about it when going to st see steve coakley lectures back in the late 90s at morehouse salute <laughs> So salute to my brother. Yes, we are fortunate uh, to have the brother on the channel with us tonight, and I'm appreciating this build. So y'all make sure y'all hit the like button, and if you haven't subscribed to the channel, Brother Dean, you up here, so I hope you subscribe to the channel, Brother Dean. But go ahead, ask your next question, Brother Dean. Well, he gave a great response, and uh, I guess we'll have a difference of opinion because I have seen the impact that it's done with, specifically with the immigrant community, uh, black immigrants, Asian uh, immigrants at all. And um, I, it's very important in terms of knowing why you're going to school and, and, and having a purpose and having that family structure around there as well. But uh, Brother Omawale, I've been seeing you do your work lately with these debates, and I, I, I'm, I look forward to seeing where how you develop in this space. It's a beautiful thing watching you work. I wish my video could work, but I'm driving like I said. No, so, I, I, I appreciate you. My my brother, um, my brother Mwebe and I were having a conversation before we brought folks onto the stream, and I was just telling them that this space is developing, but I I care very much about the integrity of this space, the folks who I bring on. I don't take it for granted that folks show up to hear these conversations and they respect the information that we are presenting. So the fact that we have intelligent black folks here who are serious minded and looking for solutions. These are the type of folks that I want to bring on to have conversations. I'm trying to move away from the debating um, because for me, certain stuff, I just don't even have time to debate. I can't focus on the naysayers. Like if the message isn't for you, then it's not for you. I'm concerned about our people. I'm concerned about the conditions of our people. So if you're likewise concerned and want to see change economically, politically, spiritually, materially, then I think that this is the place uh, for you for sure. Um, um, so I appreciate that, Brother Dean. I just got a good question from the chat. Before I bring up my next guest to ask a question, the, the, the question from the chat comes from Brother Slam Bradley, one of the producers for the show, the main producer for the show, the, 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 the man, the, 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 the man, my man, Slam, Slam Bradley. Uh, he said, what is the guest's opinion uh, on uh, NFTs? And shout out to Brother Nkrumah Torre. Shout out to you in the building. Yeah, NFTs, man, that's, listen, when I talk about opportunity and the space to, you know, when I talk about first quarter opportunities, NFTs is also one of those things. Really, we're start, we're going to start seeing new things coming out through blockchain. Because if we hear about cryptocurrency, we know, all know about Bitcoin and all the coins. The currency had to be put in place. But crypto is the vehicle and the role in technology. NFT is just another money-making commodity like cryptocurrency. And if you know about non-fungible tokens, basically it's people are taking artwork and they're selling it like you would buy a Pascal art piece of painting where there's a limited edition. Um, and you would buy that art physically and you, you know hang it up in your wall or whatnot. 
because it's a limited edition, it's going to be highly, you know, what you're going to pay for. You're going to pay a nice mint for it. Um, we're doing this now. Well, we It's being done now in the digital space. So now people are taking digital imagery and video and they're making limited editions, uh, if not just one, you know, you know, just one of one of a kinds. And people are paying astronomical amounts for I think the, the highest one I saw was you know, one of the first one was a digital meme, someone or gift. And they paid over six. They got paid six million dollars over for it. Um, the owner of Twitter, I forgot his name, but he released his first Twitter as an NFT. Someone purchased it for over six figures. Mm. So what I don't fully understand is why it's the value, because you can't do anything with it. It's authentic in regards to the imagery, whatever that you purchase, um, being that it's on the blockchain, it shows ownership. And if you're a producer of an NFT, if you create an NFT and it gets it gets sold, say I sell it to Omawali and Omawali decides to sell it to someone else. Well, when he sells it, written in the contract, the digital contract, I get paid in perpetuity. As soon as it as soon as it changes hands, I get a percentage. So I could put in that contract, I get 20% every time it changes hands. So I can continually receive residual income. This helps artists. This is how music people in the music industry and they've been getting screwed over getting pennies on a dollar versus the the A and R companies and the in the film houses get make all the money. This allows the artist now to receive royalty indefinitely as long as it continues to change hands. But I still don't get how people can see value in something that's on your phone. <laughs> yeah, it feels very um you, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, I think it's John Mackey wrote the book um Popular Grand Delusions and the Madness of Crowds. And he mm. talks in there about um, tulip, the uh, tulip mania, where the speculation on tulips back in Europe, where like the 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 price of tulips was just like 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 it it, it talked about um, these uh, craze fueled bubbles that were driving the value yeah. right of of of, of certain uh, instruments, and the instrument at that time being a, a tulip. You know what I mean? And like how it like made no sense, but it was fueled by. That fear, that FOMO, yeah. right? The psychology of the masses. So the name of the book is Popular Grand Delusions and the Madness of Crowds. So I try not yeah. to get herded like the sheep because the sheep yeah. often get herded to the slaughter. So you got to be careful. But, but there is an opportunity, though, because for those that, you know, if you if you do it right, if you get an opportunity in the beginning and you pull out before, it, you know, that bubble pops, there is a lot of wealth significantly that can be made. But again, you need to know what it is you're getting involved with. Don't get in it because your cousin Ray Ray told you to do it. Do <laughs> yeah. All right, brother D1 Beats, welcome to the stream, my brother. You got a question for our guest tonight. Hey, man. What's up, brother Omar? Thank, thank you for having me. I have mm -hmm. two questions well, uh, for the guest. I have two questions for the, for the guest. Um, the first question I have is what, is, what is your opinion on the crypto platform called Ethereum? And and it's used in creating wealth. That's number one. And number two, what is your opinion of, cre of, of us as a community creating our own currency to help finance our own development? Those are the two questions I have. Um, I love Ethereum. I've been uh, actually uh, invested and also producing Ethereum through what's called mining. Mining is where you actually produce, you get paid in the transactions that are created to do uh, cryptocurrency transactions. You get paid in a certain coin. That's the passive income vehicle that cryptocurrency offers. A lot of us are being just told to invest in cryptocurrency. You can get paid in it, you know, both in mining. There's video games you can play now for kids and even for adults. You can play when we get into the AR, VR conversation of things and, and blockchain technology. Things are working to where you can actually get paid multiple ways using digital currency as a currency to get paid in. Um, and the uh, second question you asked, uh, I'm sorry, I forgot what you said. You uh, asked, um, damn. <laughs> you said something about creating our own. Yes. So here's my thing about, and I love our people unconditionally. Um, I think we should call it a wheel unless that wheel actually works. So inevitably, yes, we should look at that. But I think. It doesn't make sense for us to create a black version of Ethereum if Ethereum is performing so well. Because unfortunately, we still suffer from lack of trust in ourselves. We can say black owned, buy black, all this kind of stuff, but very seldom do we 100% support that. So what I'm saying is, why don't we work with the things that are already working, create that wealth, 
in those vehicles. And then for those that have created that wealth, then we come together and we pull those things together and create this other currency that we want to create or whatever models we want to create that's solely for us. Because it's one thing I will always remember is what Dr. Clark told me once, as he said that um, Dr. John Henry Clark, he said that African people could take care of ourselves the world over if we just created products for ourselves. So I totally believe in that whole idea, but it takes people with money to be able to do that. Unfortunately, we can talk about how much in it. Yeah. If I got a million people to give me a million dollars, I mean, to give me a dollar, I'd have a million dollars, but we can't get a million people to do that because we have some skepticism or why does he get it? And I can't get it. Mm -hmm. So we're still suffering from, you know, the, the, uh, the, uh, what is it? The, the crab in the barrel mentality. Mm -hmm. There's still the lack of trust. And so rather than have to fight those things while still trying to create this wealth and, and trying to create a vehicle that's for black people to create wealth, why not from the that are here, pull it out of that and then use that to create our next thing. But I'm all for it. I just think that we should try to milk the things that are here available before we start building something new. Cause you know, we don't, we can't guarantee it's going to give us that type of return. Yeah. Yeah. No doubt. Yo, <laughs> brother, this has been, uh, and that bro bro brother D1, I saw you unmute yourself. Did you have a follow up question? Oh, I was gonna make a real quick comment before I get out. I didn't want to hold you. I know you like, but, the, but the reason the reason why I brought up the question about building our own currency is because 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 of that we don't have access to capital to be able to self finance our own development. I was thinking that by us having building our own currency, we would be able to have our own resources to be able to finance our own development, find the educational system, build our own economy, and et cetera, et cetera. So that's kind of, and also the organization that I'm building is also working towards that idea. So that's why I kind of asked you the question, asked the question to see what you, what you guys thought about the, um, the, the idea about building our own currency so we can start self developing ourselves as a people without having access to the capital. You know what I'm saying? All right, all right, uh, br brother D1, make sure you just drop a link to your organization in the chat, you know, and you know, folks can learn about more about what you and your organization are working on for sure. All right, all right, I'll, I'll get out. Thank you, man. I appreciate, right, you. appreciate you, brother. Appreciate you. All right, uh, family, we have been in conversation tonight with my brother, uh, Mwebe Mshengu. He dropped a lot of gems, he gave a lot of, of of good information um you know listen family like we have to be real about our conditions as a people um the fact that we are um subjugated presently the fact that the the planet is currently under the global system of of capitalism which is enforced via terrorism or whatever else you want to call it to keep this system um in place so we have to deal with what we have to deal with and the reality is Finances play a big part in our day to day. Um, the notion of buying our freedom is not anything that's new, right? We all have ancestors who may have, during enslavement, found a way to earn and put some coins away and buy their freedom and buy the freedom of their family, right? So, right now, um, I'm very economically insecure in the sense that I am dependent, right, on the plantation, like most of us, right? So, I'm also trying to figure out how do I buy my freedom? That doesn't mean that I've ended the system of slavery, right? That the, our ancestors who bought their own individual freedom and then, you know, bought the freedom of their wives and their children, they didn't end the system of slavery, right? I think that that should be our goal. Our goal should definitely be to bring this system down on its head. But at the same time, in the interim, we have to be very shrewd with our resources and shrewd with our time and time is the greatest resource that we have. So any education that can be given to us to help us figure out how we gain access to more of our time, I'm all for it, right? Dr. Milana Karenga said, if you want to free the, pe the people, you first have to free their labor. Um, so that's what this conversation, you know, is about. We can't pursue revolutionary projects if people can't figure out how to meet that first base need, which is how do you feed yourself? You know what I mean? How do you take care of self? How do you do for self? So the economics are certainly um, very important. Um, I see that there's a demand for a series on this. So perhaps I might, you know, bring on more folks to have the conversation. So Super chat. 
Sister Chelsea Galloway said, great topic. Let's put in five hours each week. Ashe, listen, do, do the knowledge, fam. Like, do the knowledge. You have to, you know, do the knowledge. Give the knowledge to those that you love. Use it to take care of your family. Knowledge is power. Knowledge is empowering. So I appreciate our brother for being with us here tonight. Brother Mwebe, if you want to leave any final remarks, I'll open up the floor for you to do so now. And then we're going to tap out. All right. Uh, just want to give thanks to you, brother, uh, for the opportunity. Giving thanks to all the listeners, present and future. Uh, support this brother. Support this work. Um, this is, you know, a pertinent topic to talk about. And I love the fact that it's engaging. I love all the comments and responses and ideas. I'm a, I've tried to copy and paste it so I can, you know, learn from it as well. We're all in that learning stage, so let's continue doing that. And if I can help in any kind of way, uh, reach out to me. I'm at CryptoWokeMovement.com. Uh, you can find me on YouTube, IG, Facebook, etc. And uh, yeah, let's continue to build this wealth because the bottom line is if you don't design your own plan, chances are you're going to fall into someone else's plan. Then guess what they got planned for you? Not much. Yeah. yeah. I mean, Marcus Garvey tells us all the time, intelligence rules the day and exactly. ignorance shoulders the burden. So right. you got to educate yourself because like you said, if you ain't designing your own plans and you are part of somebody else's design and chances are... You ain't in a good position. <laughs> right. So, brother, I appreciate having you on the show. We're going to go ahead and end the stream. I'll see y'all tomorrow for Manhood Monday. Y'all make sure y'all tap in. It's going to be episode 13 of the Race, Manhood, and Power podcast. We're going to be dealing with uh, what I refer to as flatulent militancy and global choosing signals, right? The overall theme for the discussion is modern black men suck at political theater. So tomorrow we're going to be talking that politics. We're going to be talking about that strategy. Um, so y'all going to learn a lot. So bring bring your notepads, bring your questions. And um, I look forward to bringing the brother back to the podcast when he has his book number six, which I know you're working on. Because if you're a five-time yeah. author, that means you're going to be a six-time author. So Absolutely. appreciate you building with us tonight, family. Bless. All right, y'all. Peace out.